God bless you. You may be seated. I want to speak to you for a few moments today from the scriptures as I uh, feel led today to go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. And uh, I want to talk to you about something that you need to be aware of and be ready for. And I'm going to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 8. I hope that as we move into the Easter season that you, after I preach what I preached last Sunday if on the greatest crime is for Christians not to share Jesus. How many of you remember that message? Have you shared it with anybody this week? Have you shared, have you prayed at least for somebody? Let's believe God for a mighty harvest. It was amazing last Sunday across our campuses, the people who came forward. It's one of the biggest altar calls I've seen in a long, long time. The altars were filled with people because people are hungry for the gospel. And part of the gospel is what I'm going to talk about right here, right now. Look in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, and I'll begin reading with verse 8. For from you the word of the Lord has sounded forth not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith toward God has gone out. You're not keeping it to yourself. Your faith in God has gone out. So that we do not need to say anything. For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you. And how that you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. Listen to these words. And to wait for his son from heaven. What he's saying is to wait for his son from heaven to return. Whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who gives us, who delivers us from the wrath to come. He said to those saints and this church, he says, You're, you were eaten up with idolatry, but everywhere we go, we're hearing of your faith. People in the community are talking about the change that has happened in you. You have turned from idols to the true and living God. You were obsessed with idols, but suddenly... You're declaring one God. You had many gods, but now you're declaring you have one God. And you're serving the true God. And you're waiting. Notice the characteristics of a, of a life that's been transformed. Number one, you turn from idols. You're not the same person. You don't live for the same reasons. You're, you don't have idols. An idol is anything that's bigger than God in your life. And you've turned from an idols, all of them, to the one true living God. And then he makes this powerful statement. And we're see, seeing and hearing everybody in the community is talking about how you're waiting for the soon return of the Son of God from heaven. Notice that they, they had something about them that wasn't just saved, transformed, turned from idols, born again, baptized. But part of their testimony was those people are eagerly, earnestly waiting for Jesus to come back again. They are fully expecting the return of the Son of God from heaven. They've turned from their idols, and you and I have done the same thing if you've been saved. We've turned from foolishness and emptiness and living and serving dead things that cannot satisfy. And we've been washed in the blood of Jesus, and we are serving one God, Jehovah, the King of kings. Jesus is Lord. He's coming for me, and I'm waiting for him. And the next great thing to happen in the church is the rapture of the church, the coming of the Son of God from heaven. The next great event is the rapture of the church. Suddenly, believers will be taken out without warning. The Bible said in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we shall be changed. We'll leave this world. Millions will disappear. That's what scripture teaches profoundly. It is not a fairy tale. It is one third of this book is prophecies about the second coming 
of Jesus Christ. We know that that's what they were doing and that's what we're supposed to be doing. We're waiting. We've been delivered from idols. We're serving God. He's delivered us from the wrath to come and we're waiting for the Son of Heaven to return again. Everybody's waiting for something. You go to the doctor and you wait. Your, part, your appointment is at 8.30 prompt. And you go early because you want to be there on time. And by 10 o'clock, 10, I, I, know, I mentioned in the first service, I follow some of you on Instagram. Sometimes I, I wish I didn't, but I do. And, 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 uh, and this particular member was talking about he had had to take the whole day off and he had been sitting since the morning at eight o'clock or something and it was now around 10 o'clock and he was still waiting on that doctor's appointment. He, he took the day off, he missed breakfast cause he couldn't eat for some tests he had to do. And I mean, you, you feel like I can't even go to the restroom because they'll probably call my name out if I go in there and I'll miss it and have to sit out here another three hours waiting because you might miss your name being called. You just wait because you, you wait as long as you have to because you want to see that doctor. We, we wait at stoplights. I do. And we, we wait and we, we pull out our smartphones because we're waiting. We can't stand to just sit still for anything. So I check all my messages and I'm waiting, waiting on that light to change. Or we put jelly on our biscuit or, or we turn around and slap one of the children. Or, you know, whatever. But we're waiting. We're waiting. For me, I'm waiting. I'm watching the other side of the lights so that I can rev my motor up when I see it starting to change. I'm waiting, eagerly waiting because I'm I'm, I'm stirring my coffee or something, but I'm waiting. You turn around and then the light changes and what you've been waiting for is there. The young couples in this church, they're waiting for babies to come. A woman gets pregnant nine months and she's waiting. They're preparing the baby crib, preparing the baby's room. They're painting the nursery. They're getting the curtains. They're getting all the little, little gadgets ready for that little baby. Waiting, waiting, wait, wait. And you get to the end of those final days, the ninth month of pregnancy, and the tension and the frustration. Our days are filled with that mother. Her nose begins to swell. Her ankles begins to swell. She gets irritable. She gets, I can't stand it. Get this thing out of me. I can't take it another day. And then she says things like this, I'll never do this again. I'm through with this forever. And many times when I dedicate babies, I will whisper, you may not have heard me say it, but I have said it to people as they're walking away, especially women, I like to taunt them a little bit. I'll see you in about nine months. And, and oh, they, they look at me funny and bristle. One time, this is the truth, I had one woman walking away and I whispered that, and she turned around and she said, you, might, you won't see me here. You might see him with another woman, but you won't. I said, just go sit down. Just go sit down. The waiting had got to her. And she said, I'm never going to do that again. We spend our whole lives waiting. The Bible teaches us that we're not the only ones waiting. But I want you to turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 8. Because in Romans chapter 8, it tells us that not only are we waiting, but in Romans chapter 8, it says even creation is eagerly, verses 18 through 23, it says that, that not only believers are waiting, but the heavens are waiting, the moon, the stars, all of creation is eagerly waiting for the revealing of the sons of God. He says in, in Romans chapter 8, and the 22nd and 23rd verse, for we know that the whole creation, all of the earth, the mountains, the trees, the, 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 the oceans, they are, listen to this, the whole creation groans and labors with birth pains 
together until now, not only that we also have the first fruits of the Spirit, but even ourselves grown within ourselves, listen, eagerly awaiting the adoption of the redemption of these old physical bodies. What he's saying is that everything that God made in the creation, the stars, the moon, the sun, the earth, the trees, the plants, the flowers, they are anxiously, eagerly awaiting the moment that the trumpet sounds and, and our new bodies are given to us. We've got something to wait for. We've got something to look forward to, something better than a sporting event, something better than a job promotion, something better than a new car or a new house. We and the whole creation is earnestly the trees, the oceans, the stars, the moon. That's why sometimes the earth has birth pains and, and we would call them earthquakes and we would call them hurricanes and we would call them freaks of nature and, and, and storms and tornadoes. All that is is the earth that's been under a curse since Adam and Eve fell eagerly awaiting the moment that they can be restored. As beautiful as the world is, it's still under the curse. Every flower in your yard is beautiful, but it's not as beautiful as it knows it can be when it gets the curse off of it. And when the sun comes, even the creation is moaning and groaning and the earth has earthquakes. And that's why Jesus said, the sooner when, I get, when you get close to my coming, there'll be earthquakes in divers places more and more and more and more. It's just like a woman who's giving birth. The earth even testifies the son of heaven is coming again. We're waiting for that day of full beauty like we've never seen before. The Jewish rabbis teach that when Messiah comes, even the dirt will glow. We, we, we're going we, we, we've gotten used to ugliness. We've gotten used, but the curse will be lifted and the whole creation groans with labor pains. It's creation saying, oh God, lift this ugly veil and take us back to Eden and show us how we can be in our full glory. If these bodies are, are, are good for several years, can you imagine what our new and glorified bodies are gonna be like? And then he says in verse 23, eagerly awaiting, there's a home sick feeling that's supposed to be inside of all of us who have turned from idols and been born and washed in the blood of Jesus and serving the true and living God. There is also with that supposed to be a homesick feeling inside of all of us for the soon return of Jesus Christ. Hebrews 9 verse 27 and 28 said to those who eagerly wait. Just throw that up, Hebrews 9. And it says, uh, as it is appointed unto man once to die, and after this the judgment that he offered once to bear the sins of many. Those who eagerly wait for him will he appear a second time. Notice the word eager. It's not just I know the doctrine that Jesus is coming again, but it has no relevance to my life. This is a modern day phenomenon in the church. No body in the church is preaching much about the second coming. But throw that verse back up and leave it up just a moment because it says they're eagerly awaiting. To those who eagerly wait for him, will he appear a second time? And there's supposed to be something in us that we live every day. Jesus could come today. Jesus is coming back again. It was the testimony of those in Thessalonica that they had turned. They had seen a change. They're no longer worshiping their idols. They've been born again. And one of the proofs of that is they eagerly wait. They're believing Jesus could come today. I need to live right. I need to live clean. Jesus is coming soon. That's the state of the mind of every, every believer to be turbo energized with that thought in our life every day. Am I ready for his coming? Am I eager for his coming? Am I yearning for his coming? Those who eagerly await, it could happen today. It needs to be on our mind all the time. We should live in such a way that we wouldn't be ashamed if he comes, if he came today. It's, it's on your mind. You can love this life. You can love this world and nothing wrong with enjoying your life. 
But you have to remember that this is our second citizenship. Our primary residence and citizenship is a, in a place somewhere beyond the clouds. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 20 says, Our citizenship is in heaven for which we eagerly, there it is again, we eagerly wait for the Son. Throw that up, guys. We eagerly await for the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm saying to you today that our main residence is glory. It's not this old world. We are eagerly waiting for the trumpet to sound. We're eagerly waiting for Jesus Christ to come back. Whatever you think you don't want him to come for because you want to experience it here is nothing compared to the joys and the pleasures and the things that await you on the other side. We're waiting. We're waiting for his son from heaven. Heaven is a real place. Heaven has one door and that door is Jesus. Heaven has one gate and that gate is Jesus. Heaven has one road and narrow is the road and few there be that enter in. Heaven has dimensions, it has measurements, it has streets, it has mansions, it has housing, it has cities. It's a real place. There's no limitations on our physical bodies when we get to heaven. Here if you walk up a few flights of stairs, you're huffing and puffing and struggling and your body's breaking down your knees are hurting, but when we get over there, we'll never have an asthmatic gas for breath. We'll never have a palpitation in our heart. He's going to give us glorified bodies. We're going home. There's no death in heaven. The curse is forever gone and we will never die. There's no sorrow in heaven. The days of our life on earth are few and filled with sorrow, Job said. The first thing we do when we come into this life is get slapped on the behind and we start, Wah! we're crying. We come into the world crying. And then you just start crying the rest of your life. You, you, you want some milk? You start crying and you scream out and here comes mama and she takes you back in a room and feeds you. And then where would you get off the bottle and mama takes you to school the first day? Guess what you're going to do when mama walks off and leaves you in that strange world? The baby's going to cry, crying again. And then you get up older and you're in your teenage years and you start dating and you think you're in love. It's puppy love. But, but, but they break up with you and your boyfriend dumps you for a cheerleader and you start crying. You start crying and you get lonely because you're single and not married and you're saying, oh, Jesus, don't come until I get married. And then you get married and you're crying and you're saying, even so, come Lord Jesus, please come today, Lord, please come today. You cry your whole life. You get sick as you get older and you cry and you cry cause all your family's gone and you cry cause you're alone and you're dying and you're on your, isn't this an encouraging message? And you cry and you cry, your hair's falling out, your body's breaking down, you're looking at it and you cry. But one of these days, there'll be no more crying for God shall wipe every tear from our eyes. And I know some of you want me to calm down and be quiet because you don't think you need this. But brother, I'm telling you, there's a land where we'll never cry another tear and it's nearer than you think. Glory to God. Cry the rest of your life about something. But never will we cry. There's coming a glad day. And there'll never be a a tinge of sorrow in our lives. Can you imagine? Never. Never a tinge of sorrow. Not ever another bad day. No more disappointments. Every day somebody disappoints me. I'm disappointing some of you right now. He ain't got much to say in that sermon. Well, you didn't have much to give in that offering. So we're disappointing one another. I'm just saying. Didn't give nothing, so you enjoy the free show. <laughs> Sitting up like a critic, a judge on American Idol. Yeah, that song was okay. And, uh, he's preaching all, ah, shit, it went down the street to that other church. 
Disappointments. Disappointment in your kids. Disappointment in your parents. Everybody would disappoint you. But the Bible said in heaven there will be no disappointments. There'll be, this is a big one. If y'all don't come alive on this, I'm just going to go have church in a corner. I, I, I can go back to the country where I came from and preach in double wides if I need to. That's where I start. I used to preach in double wide trailers. I don't need big fancy buildings to get happy. Hallelujah. There'll be no more. Here's a big one. Temptation. Imagine just one day not being tempted. One day not being tempted to do something that displeases God. One day not being tempted in my mind, tempted with the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh. One day that I can get up and never feel the pressure of temptation. I'll never feel it again in heaven. There'll be no carnal flesh temptations when we get our glorified body in heaven. Woo. Here's a big one. There'll be no devil in heaven. The next time the devil brings up your past, you need to say, well, I'll let you talk about my past, but I'm going to talk about your future when you get through. And I see your future, and I see a big old chain, and I see a big old angel wrapping you up in that chain. And oh, in your future, I see a lake of fire, Mr. Devil. And one of these days, an angel is going to put a chain around you and your false prophet and the Antichrist and throw you in a lake of fire. So bring up my past, I'll bring up your future. My future's better than than, than your future. Everybody take a praise break. If you're eagerly awaiting the sound of the trumpet, glory to God. And you know why you don't care? Because you're too carnal. You want to know why you don't care? Because you set your affections on things below and not on things above. Because when you get full of the Holy Ghost, and I'm telling you, if you have to, you'll go through the sorrows of life enough to where this old world loses its grip on you. And when it does, something in you begins to yearn. I'm young. I got a lot of living to do. But I tell you what, if the Lord wants to come today, I don't have a bit of problem with it. I'm ready. I'm ready. We are eagerly to await the Son of God from heaven. Drum roll. Boom. I'm doing sound effects and everything just to just to keep you involved. Can you hear the drum roll? We're supposed to, something's about to happen. Something's about to happen. Do you hear that? Yeah, something's about to happen. We're supposed to go around like that. That preacher's on crack today. No, I'm not. I wish we'd get back to living for eternity. What in the world can this world offer you that's worth missing the rapture of Jesus Christ? And when we preach about it, we ought to shout about it because those who don't have that hope don't have any comfort and don't have any joy except in temporal things. Matthew chapter 11 puts it this way. Of all the men born of women, Jesus said John the Baptist was the greatest. And then he makes this phenomenal statement. But he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John the Baptist, who is the, at that time the greatest man on earth. To be the least one in the kingdom of heaven is greater than being the president of the United States. That's what he's saying. To be the least one in heaven. I mean, if you were the one that barely got in, you were dying in intensive care, you lived a wicked, wretched life, and you had three breaths left, and you said, Jesus, save me. And that's all you ever did for the Lord. 
and you're the least one in the kingdom. And then I want you to look at people on the earth, the billionaires, the millionaires, the powerful, the Hollywood crowd, the super duper athletes with the sports cars and the women. He said the least one in heaven will be so much more mightier blessed than the greatest one down there left behind. Can you imagine what heaven is going to be like 100 trillion times greater if you get to heaven the glory than the glory and the money combined that the world has to offer the least in the kingdom of heaven will receive greater than whoever thinks they've got a lot of stuff on earth what kind of reward Eyes have not seen and ears have not heard. Neither has it entered into the heart of men and women. Don't you get discouraged. Don't you give up now. Don't you start going back to sin and iniquity now. The church needs to be eagerly awaiting the Son of God. Don't get lukewarm now. Don't go cold now. Don't stop praying and reading the Bible now. Don't stop serving God with fire and passion because we are to be eagerly awaiting the return of Jesus Christ. I received a phone call yesterday from a pastor in Toledo, Ohio. I don't mind calling out where it is. You can Google and find out what I'm talking about. Stuff disturbs me. And he said, there's a church in my town that has 6,000 people, several locations. And the pastor's decided that he wants his church to have a beer label. Their own, they named their beer label after their church. And they formed a partnership with a brewery. And they have their beer being produced in all of their six campuses. And like, we've got a welcome center. We'll give you a bottle of water and a free cup of coffee. But you ain't going to never get a beer here. And you ain't going to never get a Jack Daniels here. And you ain't going to never get a bag of weed here. Because that's what comes next. Pastor, what's wrong with you? What's wrong with us? What's, that's not somebody eagerly awaiting the coming of the Lord. That's deception. Marcus Meekham, a pastor in Kentucky, called me and he said, you think that's something? He said, there's a local church in my area. And he said, the pastor got up with a Budweiser and while he preached... He was drinking a Budweiser and he made a message on, uh, 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 I shouldn't be something out there that I'm not in here and this is who I am. And he had a recliner and, and, and preached and taught his little talk, because that's what it is, a little talk, while he's drinking his Budweiser. Something's not right about that. I don't care. I, I know the Bible teaches moderation and all that. Very few stay moderate about it, by the way. The more you do it, the more you want to do it. It's very rare when people, and the Bible does say if you're a drunkard, there's a place for you in hell. I don't want to have anything going down that road in that direction in my life. I'm not here to judge you. I'm not your judge. I'm just telling you if you're eagerly awaiting, you don't want to get more and more and more of the world in your life. You want to get further and further away from it because when the trump it sounds all that matters is that I am ready to go when he comes. And some of you need an awakening this morning. You're not eagerly awaiting. You're wrapped up, tied up, tangled up in this present world. And Jesus is saying, I'm coming again. I promise you I am. The Bible said in Jeremiah that if you can't Contend with the footmen. What are you going to do when the horsemen come? When the four horses of the apocalypse start coming on the earth. If you can't live, we're fighting little footmen demons right now. But what are you going to do when the real spirit of Antichrist hits this earth and there's going to be a great falling away? I'm going to tell you, if you live near the edge where you got it, the one little girl kept falling out of the bed, falling out of the bed. And Mama picked her up and said, darling, why do you think you're doing that? And she said, Mama, I think it's because I stay so close to where I got in. <laughs> Folks, you better get off the edge. 
You better get off of playing with sin, playing with pornography, and playing with wickedness, and looking at filth, and filling your soul with lies and deceptions of compromising Christians who tell you you can sleep with your boyfriend after all you're human. And it's just a little, you made a mistake. It's sin. It'll send you to hell. The Bible says it. You can get mad at me. You can look at me. Cry. Listen, folks, I'm not here. I'm not here to be. I, the older I get, the crankier I get. And I'm just going to tell you that this stuff, this new stuff coming, it still takes holiness. It still takes purity. It still takes repentance. It still takes turning away from your idols and being washed in the blood of Jesus and eagerly awaiting the coming of the Lord. Is anybody in Buford, in Gwinnett, in Spartanburg, or right here in Gainesville, eagerly awaiting the coming of the Lord? If you are, lift up the biggest shout you can. Dance on the, spit in the devil's eye, and dance on his head, and say nothing can compare to what I can only imagine. Get up on your feet. The rest of you, get up on your feet and give God a shout of praise. At every campus, lift him up. Break out of the shackles of sin and lies and deception. I'm concerned. We got to get the fire in our walk. We got to get that eagerly awaiting. We've got to get sanctified. We got to get filled with the Spirit. We gotta get our children filled with the spirit because there are many spirits that are loose. They're loose living spirits and seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. Wow, doctrines of demons. You mean the devil comes with doctrines to, in, to, to, to uh, penetrate churches and put false spirits into the church that pull people away from God. But I want such a relationship with Jesus that I turn away from idols. If it's costing me intimacy with Jesus, I want to turn away from it. And I want to be eagerly waiting for the return of the Son God from heaven. I am so thankful, Tim, for what God's doing with the young adults. And I'm so thankful for you and your wife preaching the truth to the 20-somethings, to the college students. We don't need to compromise. I know I sound like an old preacher, and I don't like to do that. That's why I dress young today so I could balance it out. I still believe that when you get sold out to God, you give up anything. I'll give up anything to be eagerly awaiting. I want that fire in my soul. Do you hear what I'm saying today? I have not come this far to grow cold and lukewarm and indifferent and watch my family go the same route. Let's catch on fire this morning and say, oh God, I want to eagerly await the sound of the trumpet. Are you ready? If that trumpet were to sound this morning, have you been sitting in church hearing sermon after sermon? Would you be left behind? Because we don't need little talks anymore and we don't need beer breath celebrities drinking. We need the mark of holiness on our life. Because when my baby's sick, I don't want that guy laying hands on my baby. I'm going to go find me a man of God somewhere, a woman of God somewhere that's got the real deal. And when I'm dying, I don't want him to come visit me. I want some old saint to walk in that's had a prayer life and lay hands on me and send me with a blessing. I'm telling you, folks, you better wake up. You better wake up and begin to eagerly await the return of Jesus Christ. Don't be deceived with doctrines of demons. 
Glory. 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 I can go back to the country and preach if you want me to. It don't matter to me. I want everybody who hears in the spirit what I'm saying. And something in you says, revive me again. Restore that fire and passion. Help me to turn away. Some of you are not turning away. You're turning back to the very thing God set you free from. But I'm going to preach you until, I'm going to preach the fire around here until you start turning from the idols and totally selling out to Jesus Christ. Let me close with this. I know you, you want me to hurry, but that just eggs me on to take my time. You, you know, Bill Borden was in line to inherit the Borden company, which was at one time in North America, one of the wealthiest companies in the world. But God gloriously saved him. He was 21 years old. His father owned this massive Borden dairy products and so on. And, and, and he gave it all. He had an inheritance trust fund. He gave it all away. <laughs> And he went and wrote in the back of his Bible at 21 uh, these words. He said, he said, no reserves, no reserves. And then he felt the call to go become a missionary, to give up all that money and go become a missionary in Brazil. And the day before he went, his father came to him and begged him and said, Son, I want you to be the heir to this company. You'll be a billionaire. Son, don't you understand? And he said, Thank you, Father. I'm honored, but God's called me to Brazil. And he went and started countless churches and orphanages and did an amazing ministry there. And he wrote in the back of his Bible that night after he turned down his father's corporation for the call of God on his life. He wrote the words, No reserves before, but this time he wrote, no retreat. So he goes to Brazil and for five years he preaches. He becomes 26 years old. He gets a disease in his body from that area, malaria, and he dies. But they saw in the back of the Bible, no reserves, no retreat, and with feigning handwriting as he was dying, he wrote, no regrets. <laughs> That's the gospel. This little, this little weak stuff of come down here and pray a little bit and go right back to what you were and live like the world. Act like the, no, the gospel is no reserves. I've given everything to God. He owns everything that I have. And I have no, no regrets. I have no, I have nothing in me that, can, that, that says I'm sorry I did this. And no, no retreats. I'm not going back. That's got to get in this generation. I want everybody under the age of 30 years old, under the sound of my voice at every campus, to get out of your seat and come down here to the front. Everybody 30 years of age and under. 30 years of age and under. I want you to come down here. I don't care if you've ever been here before, right there in Buford, Gwinnett, and Spartanburg. Just come on down. Come on down. Come on down. This is awesome. Isn't this awesome? Good God. The old people must be dying off because all of y'all can't be that young. 30 years and under. Come on, keep coming. Look around you. Look around you. Jesus. Tim, Tim, come up here. I want you to look around. I want you to look in every aisle. This is phenomenal. There you go. Come on down this way, guys. Come around this way. If we can't get you that way, come that way and that way. Come on. I love this. In this look, at, look down those aisles. Tim, have you got any reserves? Yes, sir. I'm all in for Jesus. Put your hands up if you want to go all in for Jesus Christ. If you're under 30, even if you're over 30, this is our time. God is wanting to move in revival in this house. And I believe that God is wanting to touch your heart tonight in such a way that it will completely transform your life. In Jesus' name. Say these words. No reserves. 
God, I'm giving you everything. Whatever I've got in my life, I am not withholding nothing. I have, but I'm turning from my idols that I put above you. And I'm holding back no reserves. No retreats. Say it. This time, I'm never turning back. This time, I'm going to eagerly await the Son of God from heaven. This time, there will be no retreating from my commitment and consecration to you. Pray that prayer right now. No reserves. No retreats. Here's a big one. No regrets. I gladly give up every habit, every addiction, everything to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And I don't regret serving you. I give you my body. I give you my mind. I give you my friendships. I give you my relationships with no regrets. I will eagerly await the soon return of Jesus Christ. Now lift your hands up. You may have never done it before, but lift your hands up and open up your mouth. And as they sing this song, I want you to let the Holy Spirit begin to touch you right where you're standing. You may have been struggling with something. You may have been dealing with private secret sin. Why don't you give it to God this morning? Say no reserves. I lay it all on the altar today. God cares. God loves you. God will empower you with the special grace and anointing of His Spirit. Give your life to Him while you're young. Give your call. Answer the call. Answer the call. We set our hope on you. Yes, we do, Jesus. I want some of you, all the ones that are around, just lay hands on some of these kids. Lay hands on some of these young people and pray for them. The anointing of God is flowing through every campus. Let the Spirit of God move. Let the Spirit of God touch. Let the Spirit of God consecrate you. Set you apart. Fill you with His Spirit. Say, oh God, fill me with the Holy Spirit. Let me pray in the Spirit. Sing in the Spirit. Live in the Spirit. See you, church. Jesus is coming again. Jesus is coming again. Are you 
anybody at every campus who doesn't know that you're ready for the coming of the Lord, you would love to get such an encounter with the risen Jesus that you would turn from your idols, and that you would serve the living God, and that you would eagerly await His soon return. You don't know you're right with God, but you want to get right and you're not ashamed with no regret and no reserves to commit your life to Jesus with no retreat. Pastor, pray for me. I want to get right with God. Raise your hand high. I want to see it. Raise it high and unashamed. This is amazing. I'm not right with God, but I want to get right with God. And I humble myself and I raise my hand saying I'm in need of forgiveness, cleansing, and grace today. Raise your hand high. There, there, there are so many hands all up and down all over this room, and I'm sure it's happening across our campuses. Pray this prayer. Lord Jesus, I've heard your call, and I surrender all. Today, I'm not holding back nothing. I withhold nothing from you, Lord Jesus. Take me completely. I surrender to you. Turn my eyes away from the idols of this world and make me your vessel. I say yes to your will. I say yes to the call of God on my life. I say yes to waiting for your, for your, for your desire in my life. I surrender everything this Sunday morning. Jesus Christ, you are my Savior. I don't hear you. Jesus Christ, you are my Savior. But even greater, you are my Lord. I belong to you. In Jesus' name. Thank God. Thank God. Thank God. I want to sing one more song. I've gone into overtime. I've blown it. Anybody who got mad because I've gone too long, you ain't coming back next week anyhow. So I'm going to sing this one for you. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in His wonder. the light of His glory. Would you lift your hands high and sing it one more time? Oh, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full into His wonderful face. In His wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim.
His glory. And I say to every one of you, 30 and under, standing in these aisles, we value you in this church. We believe in the call of God on your life so, so much so it makes me tremble at the potential that is in this house that I would not lead you into some casual relationship with Jesus. I feel the weight of this, that, that whatever served here is so piping hot that every time you walk into these doors, it just fans the flame of the Holy Spirit inside of you. You're firing me up as I'm looking into your faces because you are the generation that God believed in more than my generation. He believes in your call. It's greater than my call. We believe in you. And we commission you. But it's going to take selling out. And I know you prayed that prayer. No reserves. No retreats. No regrets. And God has marked you for greatness. Stay close to Him. And eagerly await His soon return. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. Make His face shine on you. Be gracious unto you. Lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace in Jesus' mighty name. Turn to someone and say, you're called and God is going to use you greatly. You're called and God is going to use you greatly. You're called and God is going to use you greatly. We love you. God bless you. Have a great, great week, everybody. We'll see you Wednesday night. Hey, pray for me. I'm going to go preach tonight at, um, I think it's 6 o'clock or 6.30. I'm going to John Hagee's church, and I'm going to preach at John Hagee's. The last time I was there, I'll tell you this real quick as you leave it. Last time I was there, I preached about Boaz relatives, and it went viral. And somebody showed me the other day, there's a, there's a website where there's like 10 million people have viewed that thing. It's crazy. It went viral, on, uh, and, 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 and Pastor Hagee just sat behind me and looked at me while I preached. And he's going to be there tonight, so I'm going I'm to I'm preach again. He must have liked it because he asked me back. Amen. But pray that God will anoint me tonight, will you, for San Antonio. Pray. I love Pastor Hagee. He's one of the greatest gospel preachers in the world today, and what an honor. So pray that God will use us tonight. We love you. Have a great week, everybody. They'll probably be streaming that, so if you want to watch it, you can go on their website at Cornerstone Church San Antonio and tune in live and watch on the, on the web. God bless you. Isn't it beautiful what God's doing out here? Do you love our chapel? Can't wait to baptize some of you heathens out there in that lake. I'm going to hold you down. we got a deep enough pool to keep you there till you get the victory over every habit. Amen. And uh, just walk by there and shout, Grace, Grace. And, Somebody asked me the other day, said, that's a big old pool. And they said, can we throw money in it? And I said, I hadn't thought about that, but yes, you can. You can throw all the money you want in it. That'd be great. God bless you. Lord, thank you for that miracle. Isn't that beautiful? Thank you for that miracle, God. Thank you for God's people helping us build a ministry center outside. I see the concerts. I see the dramas. I see the illustrated sermons. I see the family nights. I see the children services. I see the chapel. By the way, we're going to start an extra service. I'm trying to figure out either Saturday night or early Sunday morning in the chapel, unplugged music. Uh, it's just going, and it can only hold, you know, just maybe four or five hundred people. But uh, we're going to do that when we open it up. And uh, I may do it Saturday night because kind of unplugged, real casual, wear blue jeans, flip flops, whatever you want to wear. Uh, but it's just going to be fun. And. Uh, I'll do that on Saturday night and practice my sermon on, on, on the Saturday nighters. Amen. But God bless you. We love you. Have a great week.
As we leave here today, I want to encourage you to sign up for SOD Online, as you heard in originally in the service, where this is a phenomenal opportunity for you to engage in what God is doing, not only in this ministry, but more importantly, in your own life. You get to tap into that potential and see God use you in a mighty way. So go to freechapel.org forward slash SOD Online. Sign up today. The great part about it is that you can do it in the convenience of your own home and at your own time. So sign up today, but then not only that, Forward Conference is coming up at the end of June, June 22nd to the 24th at the Gwinnett Arena in Atlanta, Georgia. Go to forwardconference.org. We would love to see you, your young people there, or if you yourself are a young person, we want to see you there. But we love you so much, and we will see you next Sunday morning.